Hello and welcome. You are listening to Elden Kings and Elden Ring Discussion. Tonight's episode will cover modding in the Dark Souls 1, specifically the tools and mods made by the developer Grimrock, otherwise known as Scott, well, his real name. To that end, joining us at the roundtable hold is Scott himself. He's been working on the Dark Souls 1 sequel mod, Nightfall, an overhaul to the game's combat with an entirely new story following a uh, canonized Lord of Dark ending. I've seen uh, Lobos Jr.'s Jr. stream on it a little bit, and watched the trailer along with some of the other content so far. Uh, yeah, Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, thanks for coming on. It's uh, I was playing Darters of Ash to get like acquainted with what you had made beforehand, and honestly, it's just such a cool mod. I'm amazed that so many overhauls can be made for a game that doesn't really have like an SDK kit associated with it. Yeah, th thanks for saying so. It certainly feels, from my perspective, like one of those baby's first mod projects. I know it was a bit ambitious for a first mod, but I've certainly learned a hell of a lot since then. But I'm glad to hear some people are still enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, you know, anything that sort of like Everyone loves Dark Souls, and I think you really, like, you were creative with what you did. You didn't make it overly hard or, like, so super combat-tuned that it was impossible, but you made it, like, different. You know, it was a mix-up on what was already there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the goal with that was just to try to use the relatively primitive modding capabilities we had at, at that time, you know, even just four or five years ago when I, when I got started on it, to try to give people... I'll say 5% of that sense of wonder we all had when we played, you know, Dark Souls 1 for the first time. So glad to hear it was uh, somewhat successful. <laughs> yeah, I'd certainly say so. Uh, so you say that Daughters of Ash, it sounded like it was your first mod, or was it just your first majorly big mod? No, it was my, my first mod of, of any kind for any game. Wow. Um, you know, I, I was working on it, you know, in parallel, it was kind of, you know the thing I would I would tinker with and keep working on alongside learning the ropes of programming, of modding, of how you know the file structure works for from software games, which are, as um, the modders know, are very similar across all the games they've released. Which is great because it gives us the ability to really reach out and help each other. You know we have different sub communities and modders who focus on different games, but the the degree to which we can share knowledge and tools across those boundaries is is excellent and. That was the kind of big swimming pool I was jumping into at that time. And yeah, it, it, to, to come out of the gates with a mod of that size again, it was very ambitious. And um, I think, you know, as a solo dev working for a couple of years on it, there's certainly things that I could have done better. But overall, I'm, I, I was happy with how it turned out and have resisted the urge so far to go back and really tinker with it more, you know, in response to a lot of the feedback that came out. But yeah, uh, it was certainly a learning experience, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I thought... Were you learning programming for the first time while you were developing the mod, or did you have a background yeah, before that? Not much of a background. So, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist and I've done a lot of scientific programming, which involves making graphs, doing some fairly basic analysis, you know, just dealing with numbers and matrices a bit. But that was a whole different ball game. It was it was definitely my window into Python. You know, 90% of my, my modding tools are in Python and the scripting I've done for Daughters of Ash specifically, which is, you know, kind of rocks and sticks uh, equivalent, you know, spit relative <laughs> to these days back back in the day. But um, yeah, in, in parallel to that, I was learning Python for my work because I just just taken a new job and Python was a big part of it. So it was kind of, you know, Python by day, Python by night, very different projects as far as Python goes, but certainly learning from, from each feeding into the other. And, and so it, it really accelerated my, my day job abilities as well, which is nice. Yeah, that's like a wholeness of mind attitude towards it. You learn all of the different spheres associated with the language and, and apply Oh, them. yeah, I'm, I'm very deep in Python at this point. But I am trying to branch out a bit into C Sharp. You know, most modders use C Sharp. It's a very friendly, very powerful, much faster language than Python. And there are huge, you know, huge numbers of tools for all the different from software games written in C Sharp now. So that's been kind of the last two years uh, attempt to switch focus a little bit. That makes sense. And you mentioned that the, all of the games were similar, which helped, like, lent itself to creating similar tool sets for each of them. Um, 
I've heard that Dark Souls 2 specifically was made on a different engine. Is that true, or...? Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you too much about the details of the engine itself. Uh, I know just looking at it, you can tell it's different, and the, the way it plays, obviously, it just has some subtle, some unsubtle differences to the games around it, you know, Dark Souls 1, Bloodborne, Dark Souls 3, all of which feel, I'd say, more similar to each other than Dark Souls 2 does. And, you know, there's been a lot of a lot of things and written and said about the lighting engine in Dark Souls 2, which, are, you know, we have modders working on as we speak as well. But I can tell you from a game file perspective, kind of outside of the engine itself, it does function quite differently. And the main difference would be the way it handles event scripting. Now, the event scripts for the other games, uh, kind of, there's one script per map, and the scripts just contain a number of subscripts, which are monitoring conditions, you know, what's the player's health, where is the player, and triggering things that happen in the world. You can kind of think of it as the AI of the world, responding to the player, handling doors opening, treasure chests, and, and things like that and boss logic in particular triggering boss music all of that is missing from dark souls 2 and it's all done through a different much more complicated file format that is normally reserved in the other games just for interacting with characters this kind of state machine based file and that is the main reason we haven't seen the overhauls for dark souls 2 kind of of, of a similar level to what we've seen for the other games not just with daughters of ash but with you know the convergence mod uh, the Arch Thrones mod uh, ongoing for Dark Souls 3 and other huge overhauls like that. The, that's just a nightmare to do for Dark Souls 2 because of the way it was written. And I, I feel very sorry for the for the team working on Dark Souls 2 because we, us modders, we all love the the event scripting format that the other game uses. It's kind of a, a pleasure to use it relative to a lot of other stuff you spend time doing in modding. And it's just completely missing from Dark Souls 2. So, yeah, very sad. Wow, yeah. No, that's, I didn't know any of that. That's fascinating. Um... I wonder what decision could have prompted them to take the event script that had worked in Dark Souls 1 and make it so complicated for 2. Uh... That's a good question. Yeah, I, I wish I knew the answer, <laughs> and I wish there was a way to kind of subtly bring it back in, but alas. Alas. Uh, so yeah, um, going back to the other games, though, you mentioned that there were just a variety of tool sets that were created for each um, game, and that they would work alongside multiple of them. Uh, could you describe some of these tools in general? I'm having a hard time like visualizing what they do and how they interact with the game files. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I think it's worth kind of dividing modding into three categories of sort of you know things you can modify and the the tools that come along with that kind of depend on those categories as well. The first is the executable itself. This is kind of memory injection, assembly level modding. And any big big mod kind of will have to touch that at some point. So an example of that is in Dark Souls 1, the list of bonfires that you can warp to once you acquire the Lord Vessel is actually hard-coded into the executable. It's not a loose file sitting around like all the event scripts and the AI scripts and that. So you have to kind of go digging in the executable for that. And there's often a lot you can do while the game is running and you can hook into the game's memory, mainly using C Sharp, you know, using the kernel 32 DLL in Windows. So very kind of low level hacking and just edit binary values while the game is running. And you can kind of, theoretically, you can do anything you want that way. It's just very hard because you're dealing with a very low level, you know, obtuse interface to do it. So that's one type of modding. That's certainly the, the last type that I would recommend anyone, anyone get into if they're <laughs> just starting out. The other two types are basically the two types of asset files that come along with the games. You know, the assets are all those loose files that the executable is pulling in and using to show things on the screen, you know, make the game happen. And they can kind of be divided into uh, what we'll call static assets, which are just images, 3D models of characters and enemies and weapons, uh, text data, you know, for all the different text strings that appear in the game. And each of those file types basically has its own editor associated with it now. Uh, one of the most popular ones would be game params. These are just, it's just a giant spreadsheet or multiple spreadsheets of all the numbers that control things in the game. So, you know, enemy stats, player leveling, weapon damage, uh, the special effects, which is kind of this catch-all system for modifying values in game. Like when you acquire souls or you're wearing a ring that's, you know, going to modify your, your soul collection rate or your max health and everything like that. So one of the first tools we, we saw come to Dark Souls and D Demon Souls before it is just a program that translates the game format for that big, big spreadsheet into a format that you can edit. And again, since it's just a spreadsheet, all we have to do in that case is figure out how those values are kind of stored in the game format, which is a custom format that From Software created. 
and translate that into, you know, you could literally translate it into Excel or just a notepad or just a little GUI, which is, you know, kind of how we all started out. And that extends to all the other file types of that nature as well. So text files, you know, you're unloading a game file and you end up with a list of strings with ID numbers associated with them. And the game uses those ID numbers to determine which string to pull from. And if you edit that string, then you, you see different text in game and it's kind of that simple. Or model swaps, you know, that that's kind of one of the first types of modding a lot of people do. You just find a model file in the, in the loose game directory and you replace it with anything you want. You know, a Shrek or a Sonic or whatever, whatever the kids are into <laughs> these days. Yeah. And you'll just magically, as long as you've got the format right for your new model, and there's a bit of finicky sort of conversion required for that, you'll see your new model in game. And that's asset replacement mods. And then the third type is the event scripting type. So these are not kind of static models and textures and text strings. These are scripts that actually are processing game logic. They're checking things and they're making things happen. And that's where something like Python comes in. So you can't just translate that to a spreadsheet. It's actually, you know, it's code. It's a, it's a custom language that they, they created that can kind of check conditions like any programming language typically does and then make things happen by referring to these IDs and everything in the game world has an ID. And that's how the event script reaches in and checks the state of things and so checking enemy health, checking where you are using these boxes, in these invisible boxes that kind of serve as triggers with IDs. And that's the kind of modding that I really enjoy because, you know, you're making, you're changing the dynamic aspect of the gameplay, not just swapping something for something else. And there's only so much you can do with those swap type mods. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like event script is like adding your own dynamic flow or twist or sight on how the game will change. Huh. Exactly. Yeah. And in that category, you also have AI scripts, you know, that that's also code, though it happens to be a a third party well-known code format in that case called Lua. So there's at least you can come in with a bit of experience in that potentially. And then of course there are these those what I'll call easy state files, which is what I mentioned that Dark Souls 2 goes ham for. They use easy state for everything instead of event scripts. <laughs> and those are kind of difficult to understand. It's just a state machine. But you know, there are so many states and each state can make things happen when you enter that state or when you leave that state. And typically it's only used for character interactions because characters, depending on, you know, whether you're talking to them, what line of dialogue they're saying, or whether they're, they have a shop menu open, that's all handled in a state machine, which is the best way to do it, but makes it relatively complicated to edit, especially since we're missing probably the fancy graphical node tree sort of interface that they probably use to design them. And we just have to kind of convert it to the best text approximation we can do. You're editing text and then you're converting it back and you hope that you didn't make a typo or something. Yeah, you're like grasping around in the dark when the team that made it had a full-on flashlight and torch or something. Exactly, yeah. Um, you mentioned the Lua. Is that like a third-party uh, event chain for AI? Is that what it, from what it sounds like? Or it's uh, Lua is kind of a it's a programming language, roughly on the same level of abstraction as Python. So you know you're not fussing around with handling memory or garbage cleanup or anything like you do in something like C or C plus um, plus. But you you do kind of you have the ability to just check. Uh, main, mainly it's responsible for each time the enemy requests a new AI instruction, it rolls a bunch of dice and it, it checks player health, it checks how far away the player is, and it uses those variables to determine what attack or what sequence of attacks or whether you know the enemy should back off. And not just enemies, you know, uh, the NPC allies use this as well. I see. But yeah, the language it's written in is basically, it's like Python. You have a bunch of ifs and elses and, you know, you can have for loops and you have basic functions, but it's... Uh, it's a language that already existed and they just okay. i'm not sure what the reason is behind you know why they use lua an existing language for ai and why they designed their own language for the event scripting format i'm sure someone in the modding community knows and there's probably been a bit of overlap there typically is like for very complicated enemies you need event scripts as well just because you know take a fight like renala in elden ring there's a lot going on just beyond what attack she's doing yeah like right in terms of Exactly, yeah. So the more gimmicky a boss fight becomes and the more phase transitions you add to it, the more you'll need event scripting to pick up a lot of the slack because there's actually a lot changing in the world during that boss fight. And it's not just a matter of the enemy wondering what animation they should play at, at any given moment. Perhaps Lua is like an RNG focused language and it helps with being more like about randomization of enemy patterns. I don't even know. That's interesting. <laughs> that that's a good point in the sense that there's no easy way to do randomness and event scripting because you know it's typically not about that basically you just 
pick a range of flags, which are these kind of just reserved addresses that can just have, you know, ones or zeros to record what you've done in the game. It's kind of how the save files figure out what, what's what's happened. But yeah, it, it kind of mimicking that kind of what would be very basic randomization in Lua is definitely tricky. So maybe not such a bad theory. Well, I'm glad that you support it. Um, <laughs> uh, so you mentioned that you were learning Python for your work as a scientist. And uh, I mean, I looked on your blog a little bit and it said that you had like a PhD in psychology, which like getting a PhD is already hard enough. And psychology is, you know, like the human brain is like the most com complicated thing in the universe. So I'm sort of interested to hear a little bit about that. Yeah. Um... Sure, it's it was certainly a, a long process. Uh, I got my my both my undergraduate and my PhD from the University of Sydney, and I was kind of taken by visual psychology in particular. So how the visual system in our brain processes the patterns that our eyes are picking up, and you know from that very low level input, which you can kind of think of as you know the input pixels, um, we are calculating movements for ourselves we're detecting types of objects we have to identify not just basic colors but you know contrast between them and we you know at the high level we have to identify people and places and things we recognize and can give names to and as you say there's a whole lot of complicated architecture going on in the brain to make that possible we don't really understand i mean certainly we don't really understand beyond the early levels exactly how the brain is doing that how it's detecting such complicated patterns so robustly relative to you know how you can imagine we could be fumbling around in the dark all the time but yeah i, I did a, i did my phd in kind of the the material and shape side of that so there was a lot of it's kind of adjacent to a lot of what computer vision is trying to do now in terms of taking a basic input and processing it and identifying what sort of patterns and features are contained inside that image and okay. it certainly comes hand in hand with my long-running interest in, in video games and you know how to generate a you could say perceptual experience which is kind of half of gaming the the half you know the other half of the player moving thumbsticks on a controller and making things happen uh, that'd be the action or motor aspect of the video game experience but yeah i've always had a huge interest in in that overlap as well and that, that's definitely tied into a lot of what i've been trying to do in my little game development uh, quote career so far yeah i saw that you were saying that you um you were making eye tracking games. Uh, what exactly do they test, and what like how do they play? So there's a huge problem, you know, when you talk about. So far, I've only kind of spoken about the generic sense of vision. So you know, how is anyone perceiving the world? That's a mammoth task of incredible difficulty already. Uh, when you start to talk about impairment, it becomes even more complicated because we don't understand what it's doing really when it's functioning as it's, you know, as it's evolved to do in a, in a someone who, who isn't injured or sick. But as soon as you introduce a complication into that, something like a, a traumatic brain injury or a stroke or any other of the myriad possibilities that sadly can, can you know, cause physical damage and psychological damage to, to someone, it becomes very hard to figure out what they can see because often all the tests we have for vision, even down to the lowly eye chart, which you do in, you know, the DMV to renew your license, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that requires you to be able to read letters, to follow instructions. You know, you have to kind of have a an understanding of this mini abstract game you're playing. You know, the the basic eye chart is a game essentially. It's you know, you, you know, read these letters, and here's you get this little plastic card as a reward, and you get to drive this thing around. But that becomes very difficult to do once you've had a brain injury, which has probably affected your vision in some way, because vision is connected to so many parts of the brain, especially if the injury was near the rear of the head, where most of the vision system is but yeah, that's the if it causes lobe, right sorry occipital oh, I... yeah absolutely yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it yeah estimated to be about you know say possibly 40 percent of of the brains you know you, you might consider effort or, or nutrients or energy goes into vision because it's such a wow such a critical but difficult thing you know if you compare it to the amount just the amount of raw data that's coming in visually for folks who can see compared to even compared just to the other senses it's kind of you know, the, the scale of it is completely off. No wonder vision is related to headaches. That's interesting. Yeah. All right, but go yeah, on, though. Once... Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. So if you have a brain injury, chances are it hasn't only affected your vision, but it's affected your ability to communicate and 
follow instructions, to pay attention for long periods of time. And a lot of those are unfortunately key ingredients for getting your vision properly tested. You know, the eye chart's a quick example, but if you go to the optometrist, you know, that, that's a 20, 30 minute experience a lot of the time. And that's just to measure the basic properties of your eyes. That doesn't even go beyond and try to figure out if there's a problem in the brain, because that's immediately, you know, that's a more complicated question. So what we do with eye tracking to, to get to the, the punchline of all this is to design games using eye trackers that are measuring vision at the same time as someone is playing them. And we focus mainly on children who have had brain injuries. I work in a children's hospital, like a research hospital, and we design these games that they're kind of disguised vision tests. And they work for children who, you know, may still have the capability to recognize they're playing a game, but they don't really recognize that this is also a, you know, what would otherwise be a very boring vision test, just kind of dressed up with colorful popping bubbles and things. But even if they, you know, if they're so severely injured that they don't really comprehend that what, what's going on, you know, in that case, we just try to, we have this big screen and we're, we're doing these eye tracking tests and just based on their intuitive automatic responses to what we put on the screen, we can, we can figure out a lot about what they're able to see based on their eye movements. So it's kind of like translating the language of eye movements into information about how well someone can see both with their eyes and maybe beyond that you know, in terms of the, the healthiness of their visual system. And so that, that's where all that eye tracking comes in. And it's really cool technology and definitely a lot of game design involved because it turns out the easiest way to keep kids interested in your vision test is to make the vision tests fun. And games are typically fun. We, we certainly try to make them fun. And there's kind of a tension there between collecting accurate and reliable scientific data because you know we're doing these big clinical studies on visual health and then balancing that with you know is the kid excited to see us when we roll our little testing system into the room at the hospital yeah and so it's a very rewarding and, and fun job and again that's that. a lot of python yeah. goes into that because a lot of the, the game design started off in python at least we've been doing more unity things lately but you know doing that by day and then going home and coding dragon attacks and you know <laughs> things by night is Certainly a, a a nice way to spend one's time. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that definitely sounds like you love what you do, getting to be able to make, like, sick kids happy with a game that not only maintains but helps them medically, and then go and follow a passion project that uses the same tools. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun so far. So I've been doing that in the in New York, in the New York area for five years now, after I moved here from Australia, and been loving it here. Oh, okay. I was wondering where the accent was from, but I, <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> I yeah, live in Michigan Sydney. myself. Oh, Michigan, not too far away. There yeah. you go. <laughs> what were you going to say about Sydney? I was just going to say, yeah, I spent the uh, first 25 years of my life in Sydney, and then it's been New York since then. Okay. Oh, that's very nice. Ah. So how does your personal knowledge about video game design and just your knowledge in general about how you interpret visual data affect your enjoyment of video games, like playing them? Uh, has that changed since you really like went into depth into analyzing how it worked? Yeah, it, it's definitely changed. You know, I would say my relationship to video games you know, it's a very long relationship, first of all, but it's always been evolving. You know, I'll I'll go through phases of what types of games I'm interested in. And a lot of that is tied to what I've been doing at work, both at work, you know, my day job and, and modding at night. And, I, you know, I find it these days quite difficult to, to get into the games that I, I would otherwise like to play, especially the longer ones. I think the last really long game that I played was Persona 5, aside from Elden Ring, which th that almost feels like work at this point. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like a journalist sort of job. Just went, oh, okay, I, I like what they did to this, to this type of game file. And, oh, I like what they did to this reskinned enemy and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I, I think the game for me has become more about creation. You know, I, I kind of, at this stage, I get more enjoyment out of trying to create and modify new, new experiences for people than just taking in the raw sort of impact of the game itself. Though, again, if I had more time, I would certainly still love to do more of that. It's just unfortunately a bit of a, um, you know, bit of a short change on time for me lately. I understand that completely. Yeah. Always on the grind. Um, yeah, it's very hard not to feel like I, I should be doing something else whenever I'm, you know, I have, if I have to do A, B, and C, I can't do any one of them for very long because I start to feel bad I'm not doing A or C or B or A. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a very unhealthy situation to be in, I would say. But, um, you know, that, that juggling act is also 
you know, it, it means if you get stuck on any one of them, you can go and spend some time on another. And they all feed into each other in terms of skills you're picking up and, and things, even in very surprising ways. Like, you know, we've just started using Unity at work, uh, as I mentioned, and I've, you know, just my knowledge of even just the From Software sort of game engine and setup, which is relatively unusual uh, as far as I know. Not that I've done a ton of modding of other games, but I know certainly compared to something very, very kind of modding friendly like Skyrim or Grand Theft Auto, it's, uh, it's taught me a lot about how game setup works, and that's fed into my work with these eye tracking games and, and with psychology. And it's also fed into how I perceive games and how I enjoy them because I'm always looking kind of beyond that first layer now, uh, unless it's a completely hypnotic experience like most of Elden Ring was, I have to say, in terms of making me forget that I, I'm supposed to be taking notes kind of for the modding community while I'm playing and just making me completely lose myself in the, in the world and the, in the experience. Yeah. I remember when I was first playing Elden Ring, I was constantly going back and forth between like analyzing it from a, oh, wow, I've played every other game in the series, and I can totally see how like this idea and concept evolved through three games worth of creation, to, mm. oh man, I'm just getting really into Elden Ring as a story and everything. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so yeah, what's your favorite From Software game? It sounds like you're pretty acquainted with all of them. Yeah, I, I certainly the you know the Soulsborne Akiro Ring series or whatever we're calling it now. <laughs> I've played to, played to death. It's a hard question though because you know a lot of folks would assume the answer would be Dark Souls One since ninety five percent of my modding efforts have and still do go into it. And it's kind of like asking you know it's like a, a New Hope versus Empire Strikes Back sort of discussion where the the original will always have a place. Not to exclude Demon Souls, but I, I didn't get access to that until after Dark Souls Two. I think it was for me. Um, but so yeah, Dark Souls One is a special place in my heart, uh, as this is probably clear from what I what I spend a lot of time talking about. But in terms of pure gameplay, I, I think the it would have to be a tie between Bloodborne and Sekiro, funnily enough. So not even one of the Souls series directly, but Sekiro is the one I keep coming back to for the boss fights. But it's at this so stage, exciting. I find it just yeah, exactly, and just the level of kind of complexity and satisfaction that, that, that they really put into those fights and just how unique it is compared to the other titles as well. You know, there's only, only so many times I can play Dark Souls 3, for example. Fantastic game, but the similarities to Bloodborne and even Dark Souls 1 in parts, just there's a lot of overlap there, whereas Sekiro is really still amongst their catalogue and amongst the entire video game catalogue that exists is still a fairly unique experience for me. Though I do find myself just running from boss to boss at this point, because those are definitely the most enjoyable parts for me. So uh, on that balance, I would have to say, you know, something like Elden Ring, which in my opinion was the best world design they've done in terms of just allowing you to get completely lost in something. But, you know, on, on replay, again, you're just kind of running from point to point between the, the things you know are enjoyable, the items you know you're trying to pick up and things like that. So yeah, it, it's interesting. I think each of the From Software catalog kind of changes in different ways when you replay it and i, I kind of you know I, I can talk about them from a first experience perspective and it's hard to you know it's hard to beat i would say dark souls one in terms of first experience and then elden ring in terms of first experience for different reasons but then coming back to each of them i think they they each have slightly different pros and cons in terms of a repeat experience but safe to say that if I haven't replayed one in two to two or three years, then it's going to be the one that I want to play next, just because they're all so good. And, I, <laughs> you know, if you wait long enough, any of them can become just like playing it for the first time. And you, you forget a lot of details. You, it's kind of surprising how many details you forget when you return to one of them after so long. Yeah, I always think the most fun thing about returning is like relearning all of my old skills, like mm. feeling like I'm just getting back into the swing of things. Um, Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Do you have it? Do you have any other favorite gaming genres or games in general? You mentioned Persona Five before. Yeah, Persona Five was a um, fantastic experience, but relatively unique one for me. You know, I've played a few Final Fantasy games. I was really into the longer. Uh, I think Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy Twelve were both fantastic games for when I was a bit younger. But in terms of you know where I where I can't help but go back to and the, the topic that, you know, I could ramble on about in terms of game design for probably decades uh, would be the, the Metroidvania genre, which, you know, is, is kind of tightly linked to the Souls genre these days in terms of 
you know, mild crossovers like Hollow Knight that we've seen, which are typically fantastic. And I know that the genre is getting a little saturated these days. I'm a bit of a purist. I think Hollow Knight <laughs> was definitely a standout, but, you know, Super Metroid is still probably my favorite game of all time uh, in terms of, again, the one I could rant, ramble on about in terms of design for the longest and the one that it just, you know, I played it when I was young. It's it's a very, it was a very formative experience. It's kind of, you know, it opened my eyes to the sorts of considerations that need to go into games in terms of, you know, the, the player experience. And other than that, I would say Majora's Mask on the Nintendo 64 has definitely got a very special place in my heart. And as folks who have played the Nightfall demo and eventually the full release will will see, that's definitely been a large release on the kind of experiences that I think are still out there to kind of snatch as relatively novel things because I don't think the time loop genre has been executed really as well as Majora's Mask did. And um, Nightfall in Nightfall, where I'm, I'm certainly trying to do a little more, no more with that than than I've than I've seen from video games in recent years. Well, I'm excited to see what you have to make. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Hope I can deliver. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that's a good way to get into it. Honestly, I've been leaving the modding topic for like last since you know leave the best for last. Uh, <laughs> Honestly, um, would you like to talk about Nightfall or, or Daughters of Ash to begin with? I'm, I'm assuming Nightfall, since it's your current project. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly... I mean, there's, there's things to talk about with both, and I think they're related in a way, because a lot of what, uh, what we're trying to do in Nightfall, you know, I think the feedback I got as a, you know, the personal feedback as a solo dev that I got from Nightfall, um, from Daughters of Ash, rather, has been pretty instrumental in Nightfall and the fact that it's a much larger team, you know, there are more voices contributing feedback along the way. You know, we have, we have sometimes different opinions about how something should be done. And that's been extremely valuable as well, because I'd say the one major drawback with Daughters of Ash is a completely solo thing is that it really is just like a piece of the game that I would like to see. And for totally valid reasons, that's not the game that necessarily everyone will want to see. And difficulty is just one obvious part of that. You know, it, it was quite hard, I would say, a bit harder than the original game, especially in some parts. And it wasn't hard because I carefully sat down necessarily and considered the exact difficulty level that it should reach. It was hard because I played Dark Souls too much and I was only really tuning it from a balanced perspective to my beta testing. You know, I didn't I didn't really let anyone take a stab at it and give give feedback before I released it because I was just very anxious to release it uh, at the end at the end stage there. And those are all lessons that uh, I was glad to learn back then and have, have taken into Nightfall. And I hope some of the folks who were, were less happy with Daughters of Ash or, you know, didn't didn't agree with a lot of what I did will will find that I, I've learned my lesson from that perspective in, in Nightfall and maybe toned back a little of the excesses that, that were in that mod. But yeah, Nightfall, I mean, it's a whole different animal in terms of... You know, I, I often said when Daughters of Ash came out that the reason I started that mod is because the event script format was just cracked just before I started it. And uh, a very renowned modder named Hot Pocket Remix, who is mostly responsible for the randomizers. Uh, he's done a lot of the randomizers for the different games because he really understands the, the formats and the code that underlies it. And he's willing to put in the manual effort to document all the item positions and things. As, as are other modders, the fifth mat has also done a lot of randomizers lately. But yeah, he kind of found, I, I believe the story is that he found these files accidentally left behind in Dark Souls 1 from From Software. And he was able to reverse engineer the event script format from that and deliver us the first tool to convert it to a text format that we can edit. And he was able to give names to some of the numeric instructions that are in that file. And once I saw his YouTube tutorial on that, uh, the door immediately kind of started opening in my mind for, okay, I see this is immediately, I could tell that a lot was going to be possible. Just more, again, more interesting things to me personally than model swaps and uh, just, you know, tweaking values, the game parameters and things like that. There's only so much you could do with that or moving enemies around, but you know, you have to have all the boss fights in the same places. You have to have, uh, you can't really add new ambushes or anything because they require event scripting. And so we were kind of hamstrung in terms of, significant overhaul mods before that happened and when those fireworks or you know possibilities started bubbling up in my head after i after i saw his tool and his video 
I kind of couldn't stop myself at that point from just starting to put a bunch of changes in the game and see what worked. And then that slowly kind of formulated into this, oh, okay, I'm starting to come up with an inklings of maybe a little bit of story, a little bit of fanfic to tie things together. Um, and that, you know, after a couple more years of that, it, it culminated in Daughters of Ash. And there was a lot of, it was, it was a very stressful time releasing it. Again, I think mainly because, you know, when, when, when you're a solo dev, and there were a lot of people playing it initially. And, you know, I said some things that were probably a bit overblown. I was, uh, <laughs> I mean, the story goes that I basically promised myself that I would release it before the end of 2018 and had just missed my own deadline. I ended up releasing it on January 2nd and I was a bit exhausted writing up this Reddit post to announce that it was out. You know, no one knew about it. It was, I hadn't announced it ahead of time or teased it or anything. And I said something really stupid like, oh, you know, the mod will has twice as much content as the original game, which is completely off base. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll forever eat those words. And uh, I think people, most people have forgiven me for that at this stage. But again, uh, you, you get feedback from that, that, and it's hard not to take it very personally when you're the only person to blame for something. You know, I can't go, oh, you know, the team is a, as a, as a team, we made this decision that, you know, ultimately we should have thought more about. It's just, I screwed up and I did that. Another famous example of something um, from Daughters of Ash that I remember taking to heart is that someone noting that I put the ring that gave poison resist at the end of the swamp section in terms of what you're able to reach. And they thought that that was just me giving a middle, an unnecessary middle finger to the players. And that was actually purely by accident. I, I hadn't kind of determined the direction from which you would come to that swamp and leave it. You know, originally it was the original direction where you descend down into it from the depths and you exit, you know, either back up into the Valley of Drakes or down into Quellarg's domain. And I placed the ring from my perspective immediately before the swamp, and I thought I was trying to be nice. And then I changed the whole kind of flow of how you progress through the game world when I realized I could kind of design it in a way that forced you to climb up to the depths. And I forgot to move the ring. And so, you know, that came off very badly. I remember that example clearly just because it, it goes to show how careful you have to be in terms of every ingredient, especially in a game and a genre like Dark Souls, where we know that the devs you know Miyazaki's kind of famous for hiding all these little bits of lore all over the place where every item position is meaningful potentially you know every little detail in the background you know what's this corpse doing here why does it look a little different to the other ones how did this character get here you know what are the marks on this random wall asset texture mean and yeah. I think I, I fell into a lot of traps that can come along with that in terms of you know people reading uh, intention into things that as a solo dev, I simply did not have the capacity to give my attention to everything all at once. And that, that led to a lot of issues. And I bring this up not to, you know, emphasize the negatives too much because overall, I think, I think, you know, the mod was, was very well received for, relative to what it was trying to do. But certainly I, I like to focus on the lessons that can be learned for next time because I'm always trying to improve and, you know, you can't, when, when you only read the positive feedback, even, or you, you only focus on the, um, you know, even if you just try to ignore the, the say, relatively uncharitable negative feedback because you think, oh, you know, they should have said it more constructively. Again, you're just throwing away information if you do that or you're, you're risking missing something that you could have found out about that. And I, I spoke a lot to Hot Pocket Remix about this when the mod first came out because uh, I was leaning on him for support a little bit because I was a bit overwhelmed by all the, all the responses, good and bad, and trying to, you know, get tips from him about how to deal with it and how to move forward. And he gave some very sage advice along that lines of, you know, just kind of filter out the emotion from, from everything and just extract information, you know, pretend these are, these are beta testers, obviously post-release beta test is not, not ideal, but you know, it's a mod. I'm in, a, I'm in a position to fix things if they're, if they're really bad. And I certainly spent a lot of time doing that just after Daughters of Ash released. And that's, again, I bring this up because that's one thing we want to change for Nightfall. We're going to have a significant beta testing period because we do not trust ourselves to, first of all, given the size of the team, you know, it's, I've said it's a bigger team than one person, but it's a smaller team than a typical QA team. And we're not going to be able to explore a mod of this size uh, for bugs, even, you know, even once everything else is kind of set in stone, we're not going to be able to explore it just on our own. It's going to be important to do a lot of beta testing for that. And it's going to be important to get feedback for balance. Because the last thing we want is to just make some random mid-game boss too hard or we left in we accidentally left in one rubbish attack or one rubbish hitbox that is basically gatekeeping everyone. If that is something we did, we'd want to fix it as soon as possible, obviously, but some, it might not be fixable uh, immediately post-release, and that would be a great shame. So again, you just have to be careful of those details, especially in a game like this, 
where you know it's not going to be open world like Elden Ring. It's going to be you know relatively uh, kind of like the the old Soulsborne games were, where there are choices to make at certain points. But for the most part, you're only going to have two or three directions of progression available to you at any one time, rather than a, a billion side dungeons to go to if you're stuck in any one of them. And all yeah. all of this has to be given consideration. Yeah, and for Nightfall, we're going to have a period dedicated purely to doing that testing. And it, it was from the outset we we all agreed on this. It was very important to us that we really give the mod the run through, make it as polished as possible before we release. And the feedback we got from the demo earlier this year was very helpful in that regard as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, you want to fine tune what you make, and you don't want to. Uh really something to the entire public that might have like one glaring issue uh yeah exactly <laughs> but again we'll when the mod releases even after this you know theoretically it, it'll be theoretically perfect and bug free because of our beta testing period but you know we'll <laughs> all be on deck to fix anything that needs fixing right after release even just this week we've actually been thrown a bit of a spanner which uh, i tweeted about yesterday with this the dark souls remastered fix for the the online servers which finally come back online but unfortunately, they updated the game executable, and that's thrown off all of the memory addresses, which we had kind of oh, hard-coded no. from the previous version for our... Because, you know, we're doing a lot of those internal assembly-level hacks. Uh, Meow Maritus is mostly the, the wizard behind all of those. And, yeah, we're going to have to do a lot of unforeseen, uh, very dull work to try to repair these these memory addresses in our, in our DLL injections to, to make Nightfall work. So yeah, you got to kind of you know you got to be open to to developments like that when you're modding. It's not like you're uh, buddy buddies with the developer and they they tell you ahead of time, hey, you know, the, you might want to watch out for hard coded memory addresses, <laughs> <and things like that. laughs> which are obvious in hindsight. But you know, yeah. we are uh, hamstrung by the amount of time we can spend on this, and uh, we don't always do things in the theor theoretically computer science optimal way. And I'm certainly more guilty of that than most people in terms of you know finding ways to make things work that will break at a light breeze but you know that's the life of modding yeah everything's held up by spit and tape <laughs> don't tell anyone it's our secret <laughs> the tools um, really help with that as well just to quickly add on to that because you know it's it's tempting to make a tool that barely works and you're not really sure if it'll work for all the use cases and then you just roll with it and then you regret it later on because you were doing something slightly wrong right i was I was writing the data format in a way that didn't crash the game, but caused some minor bug down the down the track, and I wasn't able to track down. And spending time polishing your tools and really actually, you know, writing unit tests in Python to validate file formats, you know, because most of the modding libraries that we have are really just file converters. You take a game file format and you convert it to something you can edit, you know, a text file or a spreadsheet or a you know a, a third party model format like. Um, an OBJ file, just like vertices and faces, for example, for model edits, or FBX file, I should say, is a bit more common these days. But yeah, having tests to convert files and then convert them back and make sure it's the same data. And then, of course, you've got to load up the game, make sure your modded files work, and not just work in terms of not crashing, they have to work in terms of thoroughly testing them, look, inspecting all the animations for clipping, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that takes a lot of time that it's easy to forget that you need to kind of allocate for a big mod. I wish I had like a more proper response for your thing about like the tool sets and memory. Uh... That's okay. It's a, a lot to take in. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, I've been learning so much from all of this, if I'm going to be honest. I, I don't have much of... I've got a very light computer background. Mm. Um, yeah, well, you so, know, some of the tools uh, really aimed at, at folks like that as well. Uh, I haven't mentioned it yet, but DS Map Studio, which was originally the brainchild of Catalash, a lot of other people have worked on it since then as well, but it's a whole, you know, 3D editor where you can fly around and edit maps with an actual 3D visualization of what they are rather than just tweaking text coordinates in a text file, which is how I did it for Daughters of Ash. So yeah. we're really we're trying to make these tools a lot more friendly, not only because it helps us avoid mistakes. Again, it's a lot that can go wrong when you're just editing a text file for map data, but also to allow people who might have fantastic ideas for mods, but not necessarily the the time or willingness to learn. You know, <laughs> I'm kind of notorious for just you know having the giant Python library and going, oh, okay. I've tried to make a <laughs> GUI. I, you know, I have this GUI called Soulstruct, which I, you know, Lobos and I have been. Yeah, collaborating on a little bit because he's been kind of doing it on stream. Uh, we haven't done an episode for a while, but we were doing these Dark Souls 1 slash Elden Ring modding tutorials with it. 
But yeah, for the most part, I try to dedicate some time to making my tools a bit more polished and a bit more accessible so people who don't have computer science degrees or have you know a lot of invested time in programming can can pick it up and maybe translate some awesome ideas into into real games. Yeah. Well, as someone that is fits into that demographic, I appreciate what you do. <laughs> I can just tell you, watch out. If you start to get a little inkling of a mod and then you know you're waking up at three AM going, Oh, you you know, I, I can see it, I can see it. This this character's gonna appear there. I just had an idea for a, a little boss change that's gonna blow people's minds. That will grow and grow and grow until you can't do anything about it, then join the modding Discord server and start asking questions. So <laughs> If you, if you don't have time for that, I recommend you catch those little seeds of ideas early and crush them under your foot because I tell you, it can be all consuming when you have yeah. a new idea. <laughs> it germinates in your mind. Mm. We'll be right back after these messages. Is your land beset by endless nights? Has the undead curse spread amongst your people? Are you personally branded by the dark sign? You and many more weary undead have had these problems. Travel to the land of ancient lords today with Velka's all-expense-paid travel package. Amenities include crow talons and the biting wind. Find new purpose by ringing the bells of awakening. You too may learn the true fate of the undead. In other Soulsborne news, the Dark Souls 2 modder Halfborn Hollow has announced his new mod, Dark Souls 2 Absolution. It's a complete overhaul of the game's balance and systems, so all you Dranglaic fans better stay tuned. Online capability of Dark Souls Remastered has been restored, while the original Prepare to Die edition has been permanently discontinued, unfortunately. The original creator of Dark Sauce, Aaron, has released Demon Sauce, a Demon Souls edition of his previous work. And of course, check out the Dark Souls modding community as well, as Grimruck's work, Daughters of Ash, is quite fun, and you can watch Gideon's continued playthrough over on their personal channel. But nothing is like downloading it from the Nexus and trying it out yourself. Oh. So yeah, you mentioned that you have a decently large team, and I was looking through the credits section a little bit, and I saw that, there, I mean, there's two big names from YouTube. There were Zuli the Witch and Little Karibo, which I thought was cool. Uh... Yeah, it's uh, kind of a dream team, I'll be honest. Uh, we've had <laughs> basically every modder that, you know, I've interacted with, you know, a lot of them are friends at this point, it's been, been five years, uh, has contributed to the project at some point or in some way, whether it's a tool or playtesting or, you know, direct contributions. I'd say the major core team would be myself um, kind of doing the map and event and lighting and quest design. Um, and then iTunes, he, you know, we kind of call him the producer. He, he approached me originally wanting to do a mod together when I thought I was done with Dark Souls 1. He's also doing the music. He's a fantastic composer. Uh, most of the music is also being helped by a another composer named Zai. And on top of that, we have Meow Maritus, uh, who is the kind of wizard of the team. Uh, Meow Maritus is responsible for a lot of the changes to the core player mechanics. So, you know, we're really, we're trying to speed up the pace of gameplay. We're taking cues from games like, later games like Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 a bit, just because that that is a barrier to entry to Dark Souls 1 for a lot of people, how sluggish it feels now. Even if you're a fan of that kind of it, um, it can hold you back at some point. And um, you know, Meow Maritus has done a lot of the, the animation, the animation work as well. He's, he's created the Dark Souls Animation Studio program, which has really, really taken off. It's a fantastic way to view animations and 3D models in real time and edit directly all the, all the data in their animations. Probably one of the most impressive tools out there, honestly, right now in terms of how, how polished it is. And certainly the one that's most far away from something I'd be capable of doing. And then we also have Dane Brennan, who is a legit 3D modeler by trade. Uh, he actually even contributed models to the Demon Souls remake. I believe he did the, the Penetrator set. Oh, really? And like the blue point? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the blue point remake. That's yeah. so cool. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, he's he's good. I think from memory, iTunes in the you know YouTube video credits gave him has the actual Souls credits in terms of having actually worked on a on a Souls game or a remake of a Souls game. 
but the quality and and of what he's been delivering in terms of models and things has been been staggering. And and then beyond that, we have I'd say they're they're kind of the major contributors. And then beyond that, we have a, a, a tier of medium contributors. So uh, I'm, I'm going to start I'm going to start going through names. I want to make sure I don't miss anyone out. So let me just bring up the server here, and I can probably credit everyone where it's due. Uh, we have Dropoff. Dropoff is probably most famous for porting uh, Grand Theft Auto characters as, as player characters into Dark Souls games. And he also released the first ever demo, I think, of a completely custom map. He actually built custom collision meshes for the first time. It was, it's a couple of years ago now, but I think he ported a Counter-Strike map. I don't remember the name of it, but into, into Dark Souls, which was awesome. And he's been helping out with a lot of the collision editing, particularly before we had the new Blender tool, which I kind of just finished. You know, he was the only one who really had the skills to edit the, the collision data because it's a Havoc format. Um, which was incredibly helpful. Zulu the Witch, not only, you know, I like to say that, you know, we, we, we had Zulu on the project before she was cool, but obviously huge YouTube name now in terms of Dark Souls facts and lore and everything. And she's really, she's been contributing to the story, uh, writing character dialogue with me and uh, helping out just in terms of being kind of one of the public faces of the mod. And then we have um, some folks who are kind of contributing different yeah, again, like their their skill set. We're just you know, if we if we're lacking a skill set, we're just kind of asked for help. So Stade, who has been mo working mostly on Dark Souls Two mods for lighting, uh, is helping out with the lighting. Uh, we have Suv, who's been doing some texture and animation work. Itzli, who uh, hasn't been around that much lately, but is definitely been helpful for some of the animation stuff. Inglorious Hoko, who's someone Dane brought on board to help with the three D modeling, and Hoko's. I can't tell you exactly which boss Hoko has been working on, but uh, they hit it out of the park and we're very excited for people to see that one in terms of a brand new boss model. And then we have Horcrux. Horcrux is kind of another wizard who has done a lot of tools for Dark Souls. Horcrux created the debug menu version for Dark Souls Remastered. Previously, we only had that for the Prepare to Die edition, the, old, the original Steam version. But Horcrux brought it into the Remastered version, which saved us a lot of headaches. We have the fifth Matt, who did a lot of playtesting for us for the demo, which was extremely helpful. George, who also loves tweeting Dark Souls facts along with me and has done a lot of mods of his own. He really stepped in for the demo and helped us kind of flesh it out because, you know, we hadn't done, you know, we were getting close to release and we hadn't really placed any items or finalized a lot of the, uh, the boss kind of knobs that we wanted to tune for balance. And he really saved our bacon on that demo. And then we have Mayhem, who's done a lot of animation conversion. Uh, again, you know, converting animations from one character to another or one game to another, which involves a lot of manual retargeting. And again, that's another form of wizardry that I'm, I'm very <laughs> envious of, I would say. And then, yeah, we have Catalash, Hot Pocket Remix. They've all been helping out with, um, you know, just kind of whether it's moderating our Nightfall Discord server or just providing sage advice and cheering us on. But yeah, again, kind of a dream team. Jay-Z as well, I should mention. Uh, Jay-Z has been doing a lot of custom new spells for us. Uh, they're really good at kind of editing the game memory to create spells directly, which is really impressive, rather than editing a game parameter, loading up the game to see how it works, and then going back by actually doing the spell modification in the game engine using memory hacks. Uh, you know, you can prototype things a lot more quickly, and it's really delivered some impressive stuff. And finally, Jester Patches, I have to mention, who's been a legend around the modding community for a long time and also helps us out with managing the community and giving advice and then um, ultimately we'll be doing a lot of play testing i think as well and yeah it's, i think that's the full team I'm, I'm sorry in advance to the team if i missed anyone out uh, i checked the discord to make sure i got everyone but that's um yeah it's 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 great having all these people come together not only because we have different skill sets and different opinions on, on what to do but just because you know you, you can do so much more when you have more than one person more than two more than three more than four people even and yeah. i want to thank them all just kind of personally for how you know generous they've been with their time we don't do this out of you know any sort of fiscal reward or direct sort of you know any sort of direct compensation or anything like that we're doing it just because we love the game and i really appreciate them helping us out with the modding project, especially the core team for all the work they've put into it so far. And once we finish it off, I, I, I really can't wait. You know, I, I say that barely holding back cries of <laughs> excitement in terms of showing people what we've been working on. We've been very careful not to spoil too much in advance, not even with, you know, cryptic screenshots and things, 
just because a lot of the value I think that's going to come out of a mod like this is seeing things for the first time. Because, you know, spoiler alert, but we haven't created an entire new Elden Ring sized world and we can't just spoil little parts of it without people being able to put it into context and figure things out. So, you know, as soon as we start to show bits and pieces of it, I think it's going to be a bit easier than it would be for an original game for people to kind of piece together real spoilers in their mind. And, yeah, because they know yeah. all the areas and the bosses and the animations. And... Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I've done a lot of work to rearrange the map. Like, all the areas connect to each other very differently now. And there's there's a few kind of brand new custom areas as well that most of the effort's gone into. But, you know, when you only have a few of those, you can't really afford to... You know, it's not that you can't afford, but you're, you're kind of reluctant to spoil them on Twitter. Especially when, you know, we, we're not incentivized to try to drive up sales or anything like that. That's kind of one of the advantages of working in the modding sphere. All we have are people's reactions when they play it for the first time. As well as, you know, we do get donations from a few very generous people. You know, me, I'm Aris, and I have Patreons, which we're very lucky to get some support from. But again, for the most part, we're, we're making this just because we hope people will like it. And the best way to test that is to have them experience the full kind of design and intention of what we have for the first time in the full release, you know, demo aside, which I think gave people a, a good sense of the level of modification we're doing here, both in terms of, you know, showing what we are doing and rearranging maps, creating brand new boss battles as, as well as we can, sometimes from a bit of asset recycling, and also showing what we're not doing. You know, again, there was no brand new, entirely custom made geometry in that, because that's the kind of stuff that just takes way too much time for a modding community to do. And as people have pointed out, we may as well just make our own game at that point, which yeah. uh, I will I will kind of disclaim and say that, you know, what we're doing is still much easier than making an original game. It's kind of extremely easy to underrate the amount of effort that goes into just creating the engine, which we're writing off the back of. That's kind of the definition of modding. We're using their engine. And just, you know, a lot of work goes into brand new animations, uh, brand new assets and terrain and things, editing, lighting. We're doing as much of that as we can, but it's not 100% from scratch, which should be no surprise to anyone. But again, that's that's why we're doing this and why the event scripting thing is so powerful, just to kind of bring bring everything full circle, because through event scripting, recycling kind of can reach a whole new level. You know, recycling assets becomes a lot more exciting when you can really edit the logic that connects them and have people experience things very differently, even though under the surface you're dealing with the same, roughly the same animations, even though, you know, Meow Maritus has done a lot of work speeding them up and slowing them down dynamically to make them feel new and feel like you're kind of playing a slightly more rapidly paced game, like one of the later entries. And yeah, having that ability to recycle with a with an extra layer of polish on top and having, you know, the ability to generate what we're generating just from everything that came with the original game and a few little extras we've added. It's pretty amazing. And I'm, I'm incredibly proud of the team, not just our team, but you know, any team working on a big mod like this, like to give a shout out to a team like Arch Thrones, kind of our sister project over in Dark Souls 3, which we're all incredibly excited for. Dade's still working on a giant overhaul for Dark Souls 2, mainly focused on restoring that awesome lighting that we all notoriously saw in the first trailers and a, a lot of other edits to the game, I believe. And yeah, it's it's hard not to <laughs> ramble on about how much I love the modding community for too long, but I, I hope that you probably got the impression by now. Yeah. I know. I, it definitely sounds like that since you released Daughters of Ash, you've like gotten in with the community, you've made friends, and that's all led into assembling such a powerful team that you have going for Nightfall of people that like love the game, love its what it does and want to make their own take on it and then also just like how much you know about the community like you just like a wellspring of information on the subject yeah thanks I, I try to be but um i'm not as active on the actual modding discord server as, as i could be just in terms of you know having moved most of my eggs from from general tool making and discussing mods and experiencing other mods you know all of my Time eggs, I guess we'll call them, are in the nightfall basket now for the modding. But it's fortunate that because so much of the team is from the modding community that I still get to interact with everyone just on that wavelength of actually creating something together rather than just discussing various things or, you know, trying to... A lot of people obviously are focusing on Elden Ring modding right now because it's definitely... It's got a lot of potential. I mean, just look at it. <laughs> you know, it's an open world game with hundreds of bosses, uh, hundreds of things going on, a lot of opportunities for modding without having to create your own brand new animations and things like like I've been talking about. So yeah, that's 
if you're into Elden Ring modding, I haven't spoken about it too much now, but yeah, I highly recommend you check out the modding Discord server and see what's up over there. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm definitely going to, and I hope all like the viewers watching this will do so too. Uh, <laughs> do you have any other closing thoughts before we finish up the episode? Like, are you um, do you want to shout anything out? Uh... Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of have to give a shout out to Meow Maritus and I. If if you're interested in supporting us, and um, you know, if you're interested in helping us work more on Nightfall, then we both have Patreons where we. I release a, like a very detailed update about Nightfall each month and uh, occasionally a few other things. And Meow Maritus has a special, you know, he only releases the most up-to-date versions of Dark Souls Anim Studio to his patrons. So if you're interested in either of those, uh, jump on over and join us. Other than that, um, you know, I, I tweet updates, not as often recently as I've wanted to, just because, as I explained in the recent video, the progress video we updated, it's it's been hard to divide time both between modding and talking about modding. And I'm trying to do a bit more of that now, and hence talking to lovely people like you. But it's, um, yeah, Twitter is theoretically the place where we'll post updates, and I might get back into posting more regular info bits about Elden Ring and other games as well. So you can find me there at twitter.com slash Grimrook. And mm -hmm. I think the final thing I would mention is just that this, you know, I, I, I don't remember if I explicitly said this before, but I think now that a few more people are following our projects, this is definitely going to be the last big from software mod that I'll be working on because after this I'm hoping to do some original game design and I have a lot of ideas in place already spoiler alert it's probably going to be a metroidvania <laughs> of some kind <laughs> mixed with everything I've learned so far all my influences from dark souls etc again probably also sounds familiar but um yeah once the mod is out and you know the dust is settled the up the, the major bug fixes are in place and I've taken a long long vacation um, I'd love to share more with everyone about that and discuss what I'm hoping to do for my first original game after this. Well, I can't wait to see it. As someone who loves action-y, exploration-oriented Metroidvanias and Souls Lakes, it's probably going to be right up my alley. <laughs> That's good to hear. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I make intros. I make the outro later on. So we can just hang up now. I think I'll end the recording. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Later On. <laughs> that went by pretty fast. As always, thank you for listening, and a special thanks to Scott for coming on to teach me about Dark Souls modding. Those of you used to our previous episodes will notice that my co-host, Cosmosis, was gone this episode. His recording equipment had some technical difficulties, but he's here with us in spirit. Definitely make sure to check out question mark, server name, question mark, a Discord server made for Dark Souls modding advice if you have any, any inkling to try out any of these tools for yourself. And for those of you looking to try out the new experience that only mods can offer with Dark Souls games, then hop over to the Nexus to try out all of the mods that have been assembled by uh, the many creators since Starters of Ash made its debut. And definitely try out Darters of Ash yourself. It's been quite a fun experience so far. <laughs>